Well, good evening, good afternoon, everybody. Well, won't you let's stand to our feet just one time, if you if you would, please. Amen. God is good. Amen. Amen. Let's let's pray, Father. Thank you for another day, another opportunity to trust you. Thank you, Father, for everything that's being presented here on today. And we've learned one thing to God about you, and that is we can trust you. You've taken things out of our hands. We've released them to you. Now we just expect you to do what you do. I decrease today, Father, that you might have, in, have the increase in, in this place on today, not only in our hearts, but all around us, even in the atmosphere. Because I believe that today we're resting in an atmosphere for miracles. And I thank you for what you have done, what you're doing, and what you're about to do in the lives of the people under the sound of your word on today. In Jesus' name. Jesus name. Amen. Amen. Come on, let's give the Lord a hand praise. Amen, amen, amen. Amen, I want, I want to thank Johnny. I, I, I don't want him to, well, he, he, he knows me, but you might not uh, know how we communicate. Because every time Johnny get up and uh, I talk to Urban, I say, you know he's stupid. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't mean that in a derogatory way. He, he's just he's just on fire, and I, I love people who are on fire for God. And and there are no holes barred in in his delivery and and his love for God, and, and he exemplifies that. Um, I am teaching on faith mandates. So if you will, in, in your Bibles, uh, go to Romans one and seventeen. And I also won't lose sight of the topic scripture in Matthew 14 because I believe that's probably one of the biggest expressions of faith that the Bible has in the New Testament. Romans 1 and 17, it says, For it, in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. Now, if you would go to Hebrews chapter 10, <clears throat> excuse me, 10 and go to verse 38. And when you got it, say, I got it. It says, now the just shall live by faith. We... we in this conference, we're talking about challenges and how everybody in here will or are facing challenges today. So my question to you is, how, how many people are facing a challenge? Now, the, the, the emphasis is on stretching you and getting you out of the familiar. But I believe that before you can get out of the familiar, you better know what is familiar to you. Because I believe it, when it comes to faith and challenges, people think that faith is a movement. Faith is not a movement. Faith is a lifestyle. We read that in two scriptures. It said the just. How many of the are the just in here? Come on now. You, you got to cooperate. How many, how many just we got in here? Amen. How many just folk we got in here? And if you are the just, the Bible says that there is a lifestyle that you should be living, and it's a lifestyle of faith. Most of us reserve faith for Sunday morning where you can show it to everybody how much faith you got. But faith is a lifestyle. Say that with me. Faith is a lifestyle. Faith is a lifestyle. Now, if, if you understand that faith is a lifestyle, I've got to know where I am in this whole lifestyle situation. I'm, 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 I'm all, all about principles and laws and, and things that work in the Bible that works for me in my own personal life. 
And whether you know it or not, the same should be occurring with you because every person in here, no matter what your challenge is, the challenge is subject to you and not you being subject to the challenges. But unfortunately, what, what we do, we like to do churchy things to get ourselves out of tough situations. And if you would relate it back to your lifestyle, you should be getting out of stuff every day. Can I get a witness? Now, Mary, Mary I, I'm going to give you a one, two, three this morning. It, it, it changed as soon as I got in the door. And, and it just resonated. That's a word Kathy uses all the time, resonate. I, so I'm going to pick it up from her. It resonated in my spirit today when Mary spoke to me. So uh, I, I'm going to say one, two, three, and I want you to say hallelujah anyhow. Hallelujah. Yeah, one, two, three. Hallelujah. Yeah. That means that I'm not trusting in the promises of God as much as I'm trusting in the promiser of the promises. Because sometimes what we can do is we can have, we can look at the promises so much until we stumble and fail in the process of acquiring the promises. And we've got to understand that God is the source of everything. I said, God is the source of everything. One, two, three. Now, well, oh, you'll get it before this is over. Believe me, you'll get it. And so in the midst of all my challenges, there's a place that God wants me to be as far as my lifestyle is concerned, not just church on Sunday and Bible study on Wednesday. Because, again, that's where we like to show off our faith. And we think that showing off our faith is how loud we can shout or how many scripture you know. Well, it's okay to know scripture, but how many scripture are you doing? Check it, hope, when you are faced with the vicissitudes of life. I just thought I'd throw that one in there. You know, I, you know, you know that just means the different stuff you're going to go through. Amen? But, but I, like to, I like to keep this thing simple. I like to keep it simple. One, two, three. Because when you're faced with good times or faced with bad times, you're so, you always respond with faith. Faith has a response. But again, what I want to know is how am I in the good times and in the bad times? Because in all these things, everybody say, I got to know me. I can't be relying on how you react or how you respond or any of those kinds of things. I got to know me when I'm faced with some stuff. And, and here's the reason why. The reason why I've got to know me is that all of my challenges, whether good or bad, are based on the vision that God has put in my heart. Woo. One of the problems, uh, one of the other problems we face is we try to walk through things like other people walk through them. And, and, and that's why most of our heads are whipped because you can't do what I do. Oh, that ain't church. Well, that's, maybe that's the problem. It ought to be a lifestyle. So the first thing I'm going to give you, or I'm going to give you four things this morning, this afternoon, and they will, and hopefully you can locate you in one of these first four things I'm going to give you. The first thing is this. When, when I'm walking by faith, I got to know my limitations. I can't act on a word that God gave you. I, I, let, me, let me share one, one incident with you. There, there was a time when Irvin, it's been a couple of years ago, Irvin uh, came in and um, he gives away a lot of cars. Because he understands the principle of giving and receiving. So uh, we, we came into church one day and Irving gave a testimony about how he went to a, a car dealership and, and sat down and somebody came in and paid for his car. And I was believing God for a car. Can I tell y'all what ran across my mind? <laughs> I'm, I'm a, ain't nobody giving me no car. So it must be something I'm doing wrong. Everybody say lifestyle. lifestyle. You cannot get frustrated when other people get blessed with what you want to be blessed with. Everybody say lifestyle. lifestyle. 
and, and I'd have to know my own limitations and where I am when I see everybody around me getting blessed and I'm staying the same. Anybody ever been there? Now, again, if, if you're one of those angelic creatures, please check your halo at the door because I'm going to keep this thing simple and you've got to walk in this. This ain't something you float into. Amen? Now, the, the second thing is know what you're responsible for. Know what you're responsible for. Because the only thing that only things, and I'm going to narrow it down to two, the only things that you're responsible for are making decisions and how you respond to adversity. Yeah, some of us haven't been responding very well. Because you get nervous in the service when things don't go your way. But you make decisions based on that. Number three, know what I'm not responsible for. Know what I'm not responsible for. And that, anybody notice a difference in your own life when all this stuff happens? That some, you know, so, sometimes we try to take on more responsibility than, than we should take on. Everybody say, it, it's a good thing, but it might not be a God thing. And a whole lot of us do a whole lot of good stuff. And then if, if you're one of those who do a whole lot of good things and you're being frustrated, I guarantee you that some of the good stuff you're doing ain't a God thing. You're overloaded. I said you're overloaded. Let's say it again. You're overloaded. One, two, three. See, that your response to anything that happens in your life ought to be one, two, three. Because see, some things ain't nothing you can do about some things are in God's hands. God has this thing all mapped out for you. It says, in the beginning, God. That's in Genesis 1.1. And after, in the beginning, some things happened after the beginning that were totally out of anybody's control because God was in control. Now, don't get this thing twisted. Because I don't know how many people walk around now and say, God is in control. Well, let me ask you something. If God is in control of this world now, take me out now. I don't want no more. Because we have an adversary, which is the enemy, the devil, who wants you not, not just to not enjoy life, but he wants to keep you nervous in the service. Even while you're serving God and shouting and doing well, he still has ways to creep in and infiltrate and steal your joy so you can't have a good time. One, two, three. So your response to anything that goes on in your life is hallelujah anyhow. You ain't got to yell it. You ain't got to scream it. That, it ain't for the person around you. It's for you. I said it's for you. But see, don't get this thing mixed up again and think that just because you say hallelujah anyhow that everybody's automatically going to know that your faith has reached a level where you can handle anything because it ain't for them. Stop trying to impress people. This thing ain't about impressing nobody. This is a real walk. If, if you notice in Matthew 14 where, where we were in the beginning, you don't have to go there. The first thing that Peter did was didn't ask everybody else, should I, should I get out the boat? Jesus said one word. Everybody say one word. one word. Jesus said one word, and all of a sudden, Peter decided to act on that one word, and he jumped up out the boat. And that gives us right there the whole definition of faith. Faith is acting on what you believe. Faith is acting on what you believe, so check this out. What I believe must be real important to me living a lifestyle of faith. Everybody, hunch your neighbor and say, check what you believe. Check what you believe. I, let, me, let me insert a, little, a funny here. There, there was a lady who uh, was real, she lived in a bad neighborhood, and she was real afraid of uh, burglars and robbers breaking in. And because she had been broken in before, and she decided, well, I'm just going to walk by faith, and I, I'm going to start quoting scriptures whenever I'm afraid. Well, one night as she was sleeping, uh, she heard some steering in her living room, and she got up, and she peeked around the corner, and there was a burglar in her house. 
So the first thing she did, she had picked up a few scriptures. So the first thing she said was, Acts 2.38. And the burglar froze. <laughs> and he wouldn't move. So while he was frozen, she called the police. And said, he's, he's in the house and he's here and he ain't moving. So the first thing the police think, did you shoot him? And she said, no, no, but just come quickly. So the police came. And when the police came, the man was still standing there frozen. So they were wondering, what in the world? What did you do? And the lady said, but I just hollered Acts 238. So when they talked to the man, they said, what, sir, could, could we, the reporters were there, and the reporter said, sir, could you tell us what came over you when you heard the scripture, Acts 238? He said, scripture? <laughs> I thought she said she had an Acts in 238. <laughs> One, two, three. Yeah, you know, at some point in your life, <laughs> you're just going to have to take God at his word. You're just going to have to take God at his word. Okay, now the fourth thing. Th number three was know what I'm not responsible for. And number four is this. Know what I cannot do. Know what I cannot do. Part of the interference in walking by faith is thinking you can do it all. We'll say that again. You cannot do it all. God has limitations that he set on how much you can handle. But here's the thing. You are only responsible for what you are responsible to handle. Does that resonate with anybody? I, I was just sharing with, I, I get stuff out of everything that happens to me, even during the day. I, I was sharing with Johnny this morning that one of the biggest challenges to my faith was when my wife had cancer. And being a teacher and being a teacher of faith, there was a certain response that I should have had when I heard the news. But let me tell you something. <laughs> I didn't respond in faith. I responded in because at that point, my faith was nowhere in sight. Sight being a key word. Because all I could see was my feelings. Words create pictures. And this morning, if anybody were to mention C-A-N-C-E-R to you. What would be your first response? In the Bible, it's real common that the first thing that happens to people, and it says it real clearly, and even Peter and the people on the boat feared. How do you handle fear when you're supposed to walk by faith? How do you handle things you can see with your sensual eye knowing that you ought to be operating by faith? Again, we get into this turmoil because we think that just because I'm nudged by my senses that my faith ain't active. You can change your reaction to a response just like that. One, two, three. Hallelujah. And the way you change your response, listen, is what you say out of your mouth. Not what you do, but what you say out of your mouth. That's where the faith fight is fought. Your tongue becomes your mixer when you're faced with adversity. I shared with them on Sunday a second king story about the Shunammite woman. Anybody know who she is? And her response to a dead son was, it is well. So even though your sensory mechanisms 
might be nudging you their way. You can always change the course of your life and what you do by what you say out of your mouth. Listen, because you'll only say what you believe. Our problem is we've been saying a lot of stuff that we really don't believe. Now, this ain't new for some of you who in here. We do this all the time here at Restoration. And you want to know the reason why? And here's the reason why. Because we walk by, Faith. not by. Because it don't look good around here most of the time. <laughs> matter of fact, oh, oh, matter of fact, it look kind of ugly around here sometimes. And see, sometimes he holding me up. Other times I'm holding him up. And sometimes we holding each other up. But we just believe God. Yeah. And every now and then, and Johnny hit it on the head, every now and then you need a yoke partner. You need somebody who's going to be in there, you know, going the same way I'm going. And in your Christian believing life, every now and then you need somebody who's going the same way you're going. That's why married in a married life, in a, a couple, God gives you somebody who's going the same direction you're going. And he says it like this, how can two walk together except they be agreed? So if you believe that things ain't going on in your life the way you want to, Hunter your neighbor and say, I'll be you too. Oh, see, y'all don't get what I'm talking about. The Bible says, and I, and I heard Jerry Savelle say this, the other, not, not Jerry, Jesse Duplantis say this the other night. And man, I've been saying that every, every person I know believing like I believe. I'll be you too. Because he says in, in his delivery that all he needed was somebody to believe with him because the Bible says if two on earth touch anything. So if you're agreeing with me, I'll be you too. Another point. Your faith is only as strong as the test it survives. Your faith is only as strong as the test it survives. Yes. Anybody been through a test? Oh, yes. There's a favorite scripture that I like to use here at Restoration, Proverbs 24 and 10. And it says, if you faint in the day of adversity, your strength is small. One, two, three. Yeah, if you can say hallelujah anywhere, you, you, you made it. But if that ain't your first response, your strength is small. Well, how I get more strength? I, I want to get, pastor, I want more faith. Well, check this out now. Please, please listen carefully. The Bible says faith comes by and hearing by the word of God or the words of Christ. So if you need more faith, you need to check what you're hearing. Because if faith comes by hearing, listen, also fear comes by hearing. So you've been going home watching Jason and, and Damon and Damien and all the other scary movies you can check out. I, I know what you feel, though. You feel, you, you, you scared somebody going to come in your house and cut you with a chainsaw. And you're now visualizing all that when you go to sleep at night, and then you won't know how come your faith don't work. One, two, three. The second thing, the testing of your faith shows the strength shows your strength and reveals your motives. The testing of your faith shows your strength and reveals your motives. Now, that's a very important one. If I was you, I'd underline that, put little stars around and everything. Because you don't do anything without a motive. You don't come to church without a motive. You, the only thing is, you just ain't check what the motives are yet. Everybody say slow rain. Slow rain. Yeah, I come to church. 
Because it's Sunday? Because it's Bible study? No, uh, let, me, let, me, let me give you a revelation. You don't come to church. You are the church. So when folk be telling you, Woo, we sure did have church today, don't, don't pay no attention to them. Because they don't know what they talk about. No, you came to church. The church came to the church. And let's... Uh, let's see. Something happens when the church comes to church. There is a cataclysmic explosion because your motives ain't coming to church to see who got on what or see how many people going to shout. Now, Urban mentioned, uh, you know, what we do here at Restoration. <laughs> in, in, a, in a given church service, now this might happen at your church, I don't know, but in a given church service, there's so many distractions. See, this wouldn't be a time to look down. Just look straight ahead. So many distractions until sometimes you can distract it from being who God wants you to be in a Sunday morning service. Be be because the, the ultimate thing is for us to get with one accord so that the spirit can move among us like it did in the book of Acts because it said when they were with one accord, in the same place. So if we were to ever get with one accord in the same place, I believe then is when you create an atmosphere for miracles to happen because you ain't got nobody with ulterior motives in the house on today. That's why if you just came for this to be a conference, check your motive. Check your motive. Motives are the biggest litmus test for behavior. Why you do what you do? But that ain't very churchy. That I didn't want it to be. Why you do what you do? Did you get married just because you were lonely? Oh, Mark, don't get, don't get me started on that one. That's, a, that's another 45-minute sermon. Because everybody got, y'all, I'm going to do this, y'all blame Mark. <laughs> if flesh stands in the way of my faith, then I got to know what my flesh does to me. <laughs> let, me let me tell you what your flesh do. First thing, it's self-righteous. I'm not self-righteous. Well, you're not under grace if you are. Okay, you missed that one. The second one is you're prideful. Your faith ain't working. These are some areas you should check out. And the third one is you conceited. You think you know, you know more than everybody who you come in contact with. One of the biggest lessons I learned here at Restoration Urban Ministries is that ain't nobody no different from me. It was a hard nut to crack, baby, because, look, I thought I knew it all. One, two, three. Yeah, so when I faced them challenges, I'd go home and we, I complained to her all the time. And, and and, and then I read the scripture, in your flesh dwelleth no good thing. So the battle I had with, with, with my faith working and me responding in a faith way was my flesh. Because I was prideful, had some self-righteousness going on, some, some, some conceitedness going on. And here's the one I really struggle with, and I share this with him all the time. I had a superiority complex. See, some of y'all ain't going to admit you got one, but you got one. And let me, let me tell you what will expose that for you. Come on over to Restoration a couple of days. Man, I, 
had a hard time. I got, uh, Mary, you getting check of my time? Yeah. I, I had a hard time because, see, in, in restoration, we have a lot of people who come in and, and go out with, with, the, with the ultimate motive of helping us. Yeah, but that ain't how I took it. That ain't how I took it. I'm trying to word this thing while... <laughs> We doing the same thing they coming here to do. Everybody say superiority. I knew some stuff. I was, I was doing the same thing they was doing. And we do it every Sunday. I had to change me. See, your faith walk will never be a faith walk until you're transformed in the middle of adversity. And I was fighting an inner battle. I was fighting a battle in me to be what God wanted me to be. Motive is birthed by our beliefs and convictions. And I believed I knew more than anybody else. <laughs> Mama Lou. <laughs> yeah, and please don't let people tell you, oh, you showed that preacher a good sermon today. <laughs> or, 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 can I be real? I know y'all probably ain't used to this, but anyway. And, and then Irvin, and, and they do stuff like this. Pastor Jones, you, you, pre, you, you teaching today? See, I'm talking about faith mandates, y'all. And see, some things can short circuit your faith walk. And, and, and ain't no, guess who doing it? You? Ain't nobody else doing it. You're doing it. Irvin just hold too long. We had, we had a guy here, his name was Peter Lee. <laughs> and he, he was a, he was a, a Oriental guy, Asian, Oriental, I don't know what to, what, yeah, <laughs> Korean, yeah. And Irvin had us here one, one Sunday for about four hours. And Peter, <laughs> Peter Lee had his own one, two, three. <laughs> Peter Lee said, Pastor Jones, <laughs> Pastor Williams kept us here four hours. <laughs> And I said, hallelujah in half. <laughs> so see, your whole faith walk is going to be predicated on how well you know you and how you, how you will respond in adversity. So that, that, there are two kinds. Everybody say two kinds. <laughs> There's two kinds of faith. There's one, now, one kind of faith. Now, this only works for you if you... If you want to be true to yourself. There's one kind of faith that operates obtaining the promises of God. And then there's another kind of faith that operates when you're in adversity. They're not the same. Because the faith that operates when you are obtaining the promises of God are one of those kind of faith you ain't ashamed about. You'll come in here and shout all over the building because you just got a brand new car. You, you, you'll come in here and shout. You know, we, look, we got to close you up in here shouting because God has blessed you with something. But let there be a death or be faced with a financial challenge or a bigger one be faced with a people problem. You ain't shouting. I said, you ain't shouting then. What are you doing then? Well, let me tell you the first thing to do. The, your first propensity <laughs> is to complain. He getting on my ever-loving nerve, and I just don't know how much. Hold up, hallelujah in the house, hallelujah in the house, hallelujah in the house. 
your response is hallelujah anyhow, not complaining about what's going on in your life because, see, the, be considerate to the hearer of what's happening with you. Oh, y'all didn't get that. Anybody ever walked away in the middle of a conversation? See, let me tell you something. You can think I'm rude, toot, or any other thing that rhyme with that. I'm protecting my own heart. The Bible says in Philippians 4, 6, be anxious for nothing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, let your requests be made known unto God, and the God of peace will guard your hearts and your minds through one Christ Jesus. Well, guess where faith is located? In your heart. So when people, the things people say messes with your heart, it messes with your faith. That's why I want to be around folk who ain't afraid to get out the boat. Listen, most of you have heard Matthew 14, 25 through whatever the end of that verse is all your life. And all you ever heard was, now we, Irvin centered in on Peter getting out the boat and he stopped. Most of us didn't stop there. We stopped at the other part where it says Peter sank. And he's known, unfortunately, for sinking. Cut a man's ear off. Yeah. Promise Jesus, I ain't going to deny you. But if you're a faith person, Peter's known for walking on water. Yeah. Well, let me, let, me, let, me, let me ask you, anybody here walk on water? Oh, well, let me ask you, anybody here ever cuss anybody out? See, I didn't hear a whole lot of years on the first one, but I heard a whole lot of years on the second one. So you must be able to relate to Peter more fleshly than. So, ho, ho, ho. So, so there must be, there must be something in you like Peter had in him. And the thing that's keeping you from walking on water is the same thing that Peter had to deal with that had him walking on the water. Everybody say, everybody say, everybody got one. Yeah, everybody's got something in their life. I don't care if you're a preacher, bishop, pontiff, whatever you are, everybody's got something in their life that they're going to have to check at the door when you begin to walk by faith. But the question is, what you going to check at the door? Can I tell you what? <laughs> Those first four things that I gave you when you walk about the flesh, your pride, your conceit, your self-centeredness, your self-righteousness, you had to lay that stuff at the door. Remember Peter in the garden told Jesus, and he mentioned that around the other disciples. And, and he looked at him and pointed at him. Are you check it out in your Bible. I ain't... I, I ain't like none of these. I ain't going to deny you. But notice who was the subject of the story in after the garden. I think it was Peter. And Peter had such things given to him like Jesus said, the devil has asked for you that he might sift you as wheat. Listen, but I pray that your faith won't fail. I ain't worried about you, Peter. But your response to adversity is going, is going to have something to do with your faith. So what's in you? You still want to cut folks' ear off? You still want to cut folks out? Or, this, or, or can you get rid of that part of you? And receive my grace. Because the last time I looked, even grace was received by. Oh, come on, y'all. 
even grace was received by faith. So see, again, grace, grace ain't a movement. It's a lifestyle. And you've got to live the lifestyle of faith because that's the only currency that spins in the economy of God. What's this thing all about? I don't understand the Bible. Hold, hold on, let me tell you something. The Bible ain't about but two things. Two things. Ready? A king and a kingdom. That's all it's about. You want to make it about everything. You want to make it about prosperity. You want to make it about healing ministries. You want to make it about all that other stuff. Think about two things, baby. A king and a kingdom. I'm trying to get people out of that kingdom into this kingdom. Because in this kingdom, things don't work the same way. This kingdom, whoo, Lord Jesus, this kingdom got a language all its own. I said this kingdom has a language all of its own. I don't talk the way regular folk talk. You don't talk the way regular folk talk because you walk by faith and not by sight. And when you're walking by faith, everybody ready? You're going to look stupid. Can you risk looking stupid? When you do, when you step out what God told you and ain't no resources when you step out. Can, can, can you afford folk talking about you when you're walking around on a cane and you saying, I believe I'm healed by the stripes of Jesus? Can, 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 can you talk faith talk when you got a colostomy bag hanging from your side and everybody looking at you? And can you say, I believe I'm healed by the stripes of Jesus? Kingdom has a language all of its own. You don't talk like other folk. You don't respond to stuff like other folk. Hallelujah anyhow. Hallelujah. Your response to trouble is going to indicate that. Woo. Okay, one more thing and I'm going to sit down. Everybody say this would be, say resolve. resolve. Anybody remember the three Hebrew boys, Shadrach, Meshach, and the big Negro? I mean the bit, Abednego. <laughs> now see, I hope, no, I hope that nobody get offended. See, we, we all having fun. Matter of fact, look at your neighbor and say, sometimes you got to lighten up. You, 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 you ever notice some Christians don't even laugh? You say something funny and they look at you like, that's how I come out like Johnny Harris. I, you know, I'm, I've never been around him when I didn't laugh. And I like people like that. I like people like that in my circle. This dude right here, oh, he, he clowns all the time. People get upset because he clowns so much. I, you know, he ain't never, you know, to me, he ain't never serious. He walk around here pouring water on folk, running around the campus like, and I'm going, dude, no wonder your leg be hurting. <laughs> but, but, but you see, it's that kind, the Bible says this, the joy of the Lord is my strength. So in any situation that you're in, you better look real close microscopically and find the good in whatever it is that you're going through. Your wife getting on your nerve. And, <laughs> and you're just getting on your nerve and you're tempted to complain. You need to say something nice. That's the, that's the language of faith in the kingdom. You know, look at, whoa, your hair sure do look good. You sure do have smooth skin. Uh huh. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm going to keep on going, Irvin. I'm going to keep on going. You know, even in the midst of adversity, when they're getting on your nerve, you can't, com you can't call, oh, Lord, Jesus, listen to this. You can't call it like it is. You got to call it like you want it to be. Right. 
Jesus talked to trees. Jesus talked to the fig tree. He talked to the storms. He talked to all kinds of things. I, I, let me do this. Go, everybody go to Genesis 1-1. I find this rather amusing, but it's a, it's a faith move, baby. This is a faith move. I, I'm going to compare how, do you believe that Jesus is our example of walking by faith? Yeah, I know you, I know you do. This, you know, he's our example. We want to be more like Jesus in every area, and one of the areas is faith. Listen to this. In the beginning, Genesis 1-1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Then God said. Now, look, check this out. If it had been us because we walk by what we, or by our senses, the first thing our response would have been about what we see. If that had been anybody else in verse 3, the first thing he would have said was, whoa, sure it's dark out here. <laughs> now, you might have finally pulled it together and said, let there be light, but you would have told everybody how dark it was. <laughs> Ain't that the way that we do it when we face adversity? You might pull yourself by your bootstraps later on, but the first thing you're going to do is get on the phone and call Tyrone, not you. You sure don't want to call him. But the first thing you do is get on the phone and complain about what's going on you with everybody. And they do not have your answer. Ooh. They don't have your answer. I would much rather go to the one who has my answer, hold up, and not the same problem I got. Yeah, but how am I supposed to know what their problem is? That's the point. They ain't going to tell you. So skip them all together and go directly to God. There's a story, and I am closing. There's a story about the three Hebrew boys. Anybody remember them? I, I just mentioned that. And the first thing they said was this. Our God will deliver us. But even if he don't, we ain't going to bow. The resolve for us walking by faith is that I don't know how, I don't know when, I don't know how, and I don't know when. But my God will deliver on time. God does not live in natural time. God lives in quaros time. There's chronos and then there's quaros. Quaros in the Greek is defined as opportunity. So you live in God's economy from opportunity to opportunity. In chronological time, you're still looking at the clock. And you want God to deliver by Friday at 5. And he's telling you, I don't live in that kind of time. you just going to have to trust me. Because if you don't trust me, you're going to still be looking at the clock at 5 o'clock. You need to take your eyes, your sensory perceptors off of your chronological watch and believe that God will deliver on God's time and not on your time. But you got to be willing to stand after you've done all to stand. You still got to stand. And I'm, 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 I'm slowly fading away. Listen. <laughs> but your time is not important in the economy of God. Him being your source is the only thing that's important. Amen, somebody. One, two, three. Amen. Amen.